Good morning, everyone. Um, we are about to start. Um, my name is Luis da Silva. I'm the executive director of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, and I want to welcome you all um, to one more of our seminars uh, in the fall seminar series that CCI sponsors. Um, CCI is uh, an initiative of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we focus on cybersecurity, um, autonomy, and intelligence. Um, and we're really honored to have uh, Dr. Iman Haddad um, join us today. Um, and I will let our uh, next G testbed director, Luisa da Silva, uh, introduce Iman. But before I do that, um, let me just um, remind you to submit your questions in the Q&A box. So if you have any questions, um, we'll take them at the end of the talk. Uh, and Dr. João Santos is going to be uh, moderating the Q&A session. So please use the Q&A box for that. Um, so I'll give the floor to you, Aloysio, so that you can introduce our speaker. Thank you, Luis. Um, before we start, I would like to start in this by saying that the, with the widespread use of the cyber physical systems uh, has manifested in the increasing demand of guaranteeing and pro proving their resilience. Uh, the advent of the industrial 4.0 4 uh, paradigm, the internet of things and the enabling technology of uh, AI and machine learning uh, open new scenarios that lead to emerging threats and hazards due to novel applications, communication channels and attack surfaces. Consequently, the research and industrial communities are requested to answer with innovative means for design, evaluation, uh, evaluation, assessment, and certifications of resilient cyber physical systems. Today, uh, Dr. Emma Hamad joins us to talk about engineering resilient cyber physical systems. Uh, Dr. Emma Hamad was recently named one of the Canada top women in cybersecurity. Her work focuses on the trustworthy and resilient cyber physical system and emerging technologies. She combines practical experience and theoretical research to shape her vision for resilient by design solutions in the connected world. Dr. Emma is a senior IEEE member and is currently serving as the co-chair of the IEEE 5G security working group for the International Network Generation Roadmap. Also, she is an active advocate for diversity and inclusion in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and cybersecurity. Her service has been recognized by IEEE chapter achievement and the exemplary service award. She is an assistant professor, computer science, and information system in Texas AM University System Rayleigh Campus. Please welcome to Dr. M. Hamad for the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative 2021 Fall Seminar Series. Thank you, Elizio. Uh, should I start? Yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot to the C uh, CCI for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be talking to, uh, to you as an audience and uh, share some of my thoughts, some of the work that I have done, and re-emphasize some of the messaging around why more is needed in, in this uh, discipline. So the title of my presentation is uh, Engineering Resilient Cyber Physical Systems, uh, Including Autonomy, uh, Risk, and Trust. Um, thanks, Alozio, for the great summary <laughs> uh, about, uh, about myself. Uh, to fill in some of the blanks, I did work in industry and in uh, academia. Uh, I recently came back to academia with the hope that uh, you can make a difference in the next generation technology. Um, all right, so let's start with this as a motivation. Uh, so in general, when we see the cyber physical systems, we see them in the news in two contexts. One context is when they are targeted by uh, active cyber threats, 
And in the other, on the other side, and sometimes we do not uh, really pay attention to this, is when they are um, targeted by uh, extreme contingencies. Uh, similar, uh, this has happened more frequently recently, and here in Texas, it happened as, as late as uh, February this year when we were hit with a historic snowstorm. Uh, both sides of uh, this, this view that is presented on this slide re-emphasize uh, one message, which is uh, cyber physical systems are built within certain constraints that lend themselves into being um, uh, of lower resiliency than uh, what is expected. And we will touch on that from an engineering perspective in a minute. Um, with that, let's redefine what resilience is. Resilience is the ability of any system to absorb, withstand, and recover from external stressors. And uh, here we are presented by extreme stressors as environmental or contingencies like um, um, non-planned uh, system operational condition conditions or cyber attacks. And uh, most of you are within the cybersecurity domain, so this is not uh, new news, but here we want to highlight the trends that are uh, in the threat landscape right now. So we are seeing more uh, increased autom automation, uh, increased complexity in the attacks, and uh, more data-centric approaches. Um, some statistics say that 88% of security professionals expect AI-driven attacks will become mainstream. Um, and uh, another expectation in the, for the future is the um, uh, world of algorithms where we have defensive AI against offensive AI. Uh, and on the, we can drill into details, but uh, the main message from this slide is we will continue to see this tr a trend forward, meaning as system engineers and uh, system researchers, we have to take into account that whatever is available to us as an uh, emerging technology, it's also available for the other side. All right, so uh, what are cyber physical systems? Um, cyber physical systems exist in uh, several manifestations. It could be your uh, wearable, uh, wearable uh, health device. It could be your IoT device at home. It could be manufacturing, um, uh, manufacturing floor, uh, intelligent transportation systems, energy systems, um, building management systems even. And uh, etc. So wherever there is a, man, uh, a direct impact on the physical environment, that is where we describe um, a physical system. There are there are some dynamics that are involved, and then we enable a more smart operation by including connectivity and intelligence. So this diagram uh, portrays an abstraction, a high-level abstraction of any cyber physical system. Um, some of the most known. Uh, cyber physical systems are part of our critical infrastructures. And uh, um, the key here is to look at this with the interdependence between those critical infrastructure systems. This is to motivate the importance and the criticality of handling this with a more um, resilience by design uh, angle. So as you can see, for example, if we look at the energy system, it enables many other critical infrastructure systems. And we know um, uh, we, we can intuitively understand that. Uh, with that in mind, some of the work that I will show was focused on energy systems because they are one of the most complex systems, especially with the coupling. But uh, nonetheless, this can be generalized to other uh, systems as well. All right, uh, you often hear that those terms. Uh, you hear about uh, IoT, you hear about industrial control systems, operational technology, and cyber physical systems. And I thought this, uh, this diagram kind of explains the relationship between them uh, so that you know, like when you're talking about cyber physical system, this includes IT and OT, this includes industrial control systems and SCADA, and uh, most importantly, it intersects because most of the sensory and actuation that we have seen in the previous uh, block diagram is actually industrial internet of things. Now, uh, we move into how, how we have conflicting goals, right? When we come to innovation and resilience and cybersecurity. So innovation um, aims to improve, uh, improve the system operation. So that's optimization. And at the same time, uh, it wants to improve the usability. So it wants, uh, we try to innovate to make things more, a bit more convenient for us, right? Um, 
but that con directly conflicts with cybersecurity goals. Uh, or let me rephrase it, cyber when we introduce cybersecurity, it impacts those uh, goals of innovation. So cybersecurity could translate with an inconvenience, could impact optimization and performance as uh, we, as people who work in cyber physical systems know because of added overhead or because of complexity, et cetera. And it doesn't certainly uh, include additional cost. Now the conversation becomes a bit more difficult when we talk about resilience because resilience aims to improve the reliability uh, within a certain guarantee. And that incurs additional, further additional cost. So it's, we have conflicting goals. And uh, to make things a little bit uh, more comprehensive from our viewpoint, we know that uh, security in general is not just technology, it's a technology process and people. And when we want to improve the, uh, the resilience, we have to think about the, over, the other elements within our resilience framework. So this is be um, have become to be known as the digital trustworthiness framework. So we have elements as trust, and trust is can be comprised of several elements, including security, safety, privacy, reliability, and resilience. Um, with that in mind, uh, there has been uh, several um, several innovations uh, lately that tried aim to measure, define what resilience is, measure systems resilience, provide metrics to measure resilience, and uh, provide approaches to improve resilience. And the slide here is based on the, one of the latest uh, publications by NIST, which is that um, 800-160 volume two, developing cyber resilient systems. Uh, what, what I would like to emphasize from uh, those uh, basic elements for resilience is uh, in our design for systems, if from an engineering discipline uh, approach, we did include those elements intuitively. So for example, when we talk about diversity and redundancy, it's one of the most used principle of uh, resilience. When you have uh, two systems, uh, two system, or when you plan contingency by including additional resources. Uh, but what becomes more interesting is when we rethink redundancy, and I will talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, coordinated protection becomes more interesting when we have um, more integrated cyber physical systems, uh, such as, and let's uh, think about this for a minute. So when um, the interdependency between some of the critical infrastructure systems is becoming more and more uh, strong, such as between uh, distributed energy resources, uh, distribution uh, systems and uh, electric vehicles or electric transportation in general. Another principle that we want to pay attention in, uh, to in this figure is what we call contextual awareness. Uh, contextual awareness is when you have some information about events, uh, falls or attacks, but without a context, they might be overlooked or altogether not, uh, not alerted. So that is an important piece to construct that context uh, and enrich the data to enable action. With that in mind, uh, we want to remember that uh, we are talking about complex systems, uh, but a system is as weak as its weakest link. That takes us into uh, the main challenges when we talk about resilience. Uh, we have unprecedented uh, levels of uncertainty, uh, but it can also make, uh, make the argument for an opportunity because uh, if we have enough flexibility in the system, and if we have efficient operation, we can uh, handle this uncertainty. Autonomy, we have increasing levels of autonomy, and that is uh, motivated by uh, technological innovation that makes sense, right? Uh, with more distributed uh, systems, with high scale, large scale deployments, such as in IoT, um, autonomy, autonomous system will become more and more mainstream. But we argue that for us, from a resilience perspective, we have to balance individual and group benefits. And we will see one example for that really quickly. Um, interactions and limitations uh, between systems of systems. Um, some, some of our innovation is aiming to limit those interactions, and but for the most part, we are increasing this connectivity. We're going towards a hyper-connected uh, economy, and that will 
again, we can see it as a challenge, but we can also uh, leverage it in improving the resilience uh, as an opportunity. All right, so from a current state perspective, uh, we can, and this is my view on the, the maturity of solutions when it comes to security and resilience of uh, cyber physical systems. Um, in the diagram to the left, uh, we can perceive those systems in a pyramid, uh, in a pyramid approach from uh, bottom up, uh, from in a bottom up approach. We have uh, the physical assets, uh, which is the technology infrastructure, including uh, communication links, including uh, RTUs, including uh, PLCs, etc. Then we have the subsystem logic. But overarching, we have the process, then we have the system, and we have applications that run on those systems. The attack complexity and impact increases as attackers uh, target systems and applications. And we have seen examples from, uh, of this in recent attacks and campaigns. While security solutions, existing security solutions and technologies focus on the bottom layers of this pyramid. And we certainly have um, a really good solution when it comes to visibility of assets, uh, uh, anomaly detection uh, on the, on the, um, against the baseline for a point in time behavior of the system. However, uh, we are really missing on the application and the system integrity, uh, integrity checks. Uh, there are some good efforts, but uh, a lot more is needed. This is just one example. So focusing on energy systems, uh, we, we see lots of standards, lots of regulations that aim to improve the cybersecurity and resilience uh, postures, uh, posture of those systems. But we have to keep in mind that compliance with those standards and frameworks does not translate to uh, security necessarily. Some of the standards do help a lot, but uh, recall what we just said. We said the system is as weak as its weakest link. And this is why uh, we have seen the uh, recent uh, standards such as the zero trust architecture uh, that came late last year from NEST, re-emphasizing that we should not look at um, a, a traditional structural, uh, traditional structure of a system where we have perimeter, we have uh, fixed um, assets or some moving assets within uh, within a, within a range of mobility. We have much more fluid cyber physical systems right now, and this is why we are rethinking uh, how they are related. So, uh, in a, in summary, uh, a lot has been done, but a lot more is needed. All right, um, you will hear a lot about IT and OT, and uh, this is on the bottom layers of what I just talked about, where we have uh, solutions that are focused on the physical dynamics, and then we have solutions that are focused on the cyber. So this, is, this can translate to our cyber physical uh, block diagram. Now, those technologies are converging, meaning we, can, we have already been seeing uh, solutions in cyber physical systems that combine the functionality from an IT perspective and OT perspective, such as uh, security gateways for cyber physical system in the base stations, for example. Now, there are uh, concerns about this convergence because usually OT assets have, uh, have limitations and we'll, uh, we will not have the space or time to talk about that today, but more than happy to follow up uh, afterwards. All right, so um, with that, with all of that in mind, let's rethink resilience. Let's take into account that we have some uncertainty. And I want to convince you in the next few slides that this uncertainty does exist. And uh, we need to uh, step away from trying to oversimplify uh, cyber physical systems. We really need to understand the complexity to be able to improve that resilience. Uh, we can continue to have uh, some holistic approaches, which will help in the short to medium term, but on the long term, we really need to embed uh, resilience within the design of the system. All right, so uh, those who worked in design uh, are familiar with this on a more detailed level, but in an abstract level, we usually have our system model, 
we have another model for the error and noise. And within that model, we assume a small, a small margin. And uh, we work with that and we end up with a good uh, trusted system design that could handle this small amount of error and noise. Perfect, right? Now, when the error and noise go beyond our assumptions, we try to work with it by um, collecting more measurements. And with those measurements, we do some optimization. We are still able to operate our systems. What happens with, when we include cyber physical and cyber attacks is our model for the small margin and even the increased margin is, is not applicable anymore. And it's hard for us to design systems on a risk or an uncertainty that cannot be quantified. So this is where risk comes into play. And <laughs> my stick figure here is really thinking risk is measurable uncertainty, but uncertainty is unmeasurable risk. So where do we start? <clears throat> to further uh, enhance that picture in your minds, this is, um, a, uh, this is a statistic from 2018 about the attack distribution of uh, the camp best attacks uh, overall. What you should <laughs> uh, grasp from this picture is the unknown. So of all attacks that were successfully classified and identified, there were 16% unknown attacks. So that's again, uncertainty. Uh, when we want to protect a system or improve a system resilience against a threat landscape, uh, knowingly that there is a large unknown attack, uh, portion of that, it makes our job a little bit more uh, challenging. We have to be more creative. What's missing from this graph is what has not been even detected. So this is, this, uh, the 16% is a detected attack, but it's unknown. It was not, it, they were not able to classify it. Behind this figure, there's a whole other class of attacks that were not detected. So uncertainty keeps growing. All right, so with that, we move to uh, what we said in a minute, uh, before in a minute, we really need to get closer to our cyber physical systems, understand their complexity, accept that there is a high level of uncertainty, do not put like strong assumptions. We do not need necessarily to change uh, the core design principles, but we need to uh, be able to uh, expand them a little so that the system continues to be resilient in the face of a low probability, high impact events. All right, so let's take a few examples of those complex uh, systems. So uh, the first example is energy systems. And the purpose of resilience on those systems would be, they are very sensitive uh, when it comes to stability. And the stability criteria could be in, in the order of milliseconds. Like if, if we miss that opportunity window, the system can, could go unstable. And that because of the coupling, this will result in cascading effects and blackouts. And this is not uh, just theoretical speculation. It has happened before. And uh, if we do not do some fundamental research, it will continue to be uh, a possibility, right? Now, uh, if we uh, get closer and understand this complexity and understand the time constraints, we are able to, uh, using the design principles from a resilience perspective, re-engineer those systems and re-engineer them in a way that we can guarantee the stability while we collect enough resources and enough action to um, react and response, respond to the active threat. Another example is uh, connected mobility. Connected mobility is, uh, is, is becoming more and more uh, mainstream, but in the future, we will see like even like more innovative uh, the models of connected uh, mobility, <coughs> including the use of uh, drones and uh, for uh, communication and critical functionality in the society. And this is evident in our vision for a smart city. With that, we also need to understand uh, the complexity of the system. And this has been proven by 3GBB uh, recent efforts. So they are coming up with quality of service metrics for um, 5G and 6G network that do understand the limitations of these server physical systems and provide guarantees on the service 
to ensure that they continue to operate uh, with uh, um, accepted uh, reliability. Now, we start introducing now the interdependence. So uh, these are connected mobility systems. They have interdependence to energy, as you can see from the right uh, figure, right? We have the smart power system as well. So it's get, becoming more and more complex. Uh, another example comes from 5G. So 5G is envisioned to provide that connectivity to every, uh, every point. Now with that connectivity, we still have some of the most critical functions. For example, first responder networks and first responder networks in the next gen technology could leverage mobility, could leverage uh, energy systems, could leverage cyber, uh, more modular cyber physical systems, but will rely on this critical piece that is called the 5G. So if I have all this, all these layers of security, I need to like move in my strategy for defending and improving the resilience. So with those complex systems in mind, we move into how we think about engineering. So I re, uh, re bring this again, which is our uh, cyber physical resilience uh, guiding design principles. And we look at few examples where we can include resilience by design. First, let's ask our, uh, ourselves this question. If we are looking at a complex system and we want to balance, we want, we talked about the conflicting goals of performance and resilience. We want to be able to improve the resilience with adequate performance. Can we do that? So we take one example for a cyber physical system and we uh, rethink resilience. We say, okay, can I use other resources just, uh, such as uh, new technologies, maybe energy storage, maybe uh, mobile electric vehicles, use sensory, advanced sensory, and use adaptive uh, communication systems to enable more, uh, more creative ways to define control. Control is a, is a basic technology in cyber physical systems, which enables us to uh, actuate the dynamics of the system to maintain stability and uh, operational optimization. Now, uh, with this approach, we can actually change our architecture based on the state of the cyber system. So if there is an adversary that's targeting the availability of our, my communication in a complex system, I can uh, switch between centralized, decentralized, and distributed. And within even areas, I can, under by understanding the resources that are available to me, I can even have more adaptive uh, response in that, uh, that, in that architecture locally. Um, this is great, but again, uh, what the main uh, criteria or the strategy would be, I will operate in a less resilient position as long as nothing is happening. Once something is happening, uh, there's a high uncertainty, a higher level of uncertainty or risk, I'll move to a less uh, performance region, but with improved resilience, because I will be in an anticipation mode that something worse could happen. So this uh, this capitalizes on flexibility, uh, resilience, and uh, balancing conflicting goals of security and performance. Let's ask ourselves another question. So can the system remain optimally operation during this cyber physical dis uh, disruption? Can it uh, remain stable? And within that stability also have some optimality in that uh, operation. So the answer is yes, we could do that. If we think about uncertainty as a parameter that we can include in the closed loop automation of my uh, dynamic uh, physical system. So uh, in the figure to the left, uh, uh, if you can see here, you normally when we engineer systems, we especially for control, we have an, uh, a region that uh, separates instability uh, from stability. And this is where we try to put our parameters for the system to operate in the stable region. To operate in a very optimal way, we are very close to the instability, but we leave a margin for, of safety. Now, if we can capture the level of uncertainty that, as we said, is beyond our design uh, parameters, if we can capture this and make it part of the closed loop automation, we will be able to optimize our system operation and extend it so that we do not, uh, we do not face instability uh, in a short term. So uh, we are able to do that 
for a class of systems, and uh, we are working right now to extend it for other systems. The main idea is to be able to quantify, capture that uncertainty in a metric that can be used in the dynamics of the system. Um, now, uh, our some of our interesting findings is that high uncertainty will require more conservative operation, as we said. Um, we can do design under that uncertainty. And the most inter interesting thing is we can improve that adaptive operation, even extend it to the cyber and uh, later extend it as a bi-directional uh, design element. Okay, so that's what we did on the physical system. How about the cyber? On the cyber, can we design a system that will avoid risky communication parts of the network that might be under active threat or historically been targeted or vulnerable uh, while maintaining performance? The answer is yes. And that is uh, exactly what is being done or provisioned to be done in 5G networks using software-defined networks and uh, um, service chaining. So we do uh, the study, we uh, design algorithms that take multiple constraints into account, con including security and performance. But we find that uh, if we have really strict quality of service constraints, meaning that uh, the system needs to operate within a margin that does not allow me to impose a lot of security, then risk cannot be avoided uh, totally, but expo exposure to the vulnerability can be quantified. We can actually know if what, what we are risking, right? All right, so we did some adaptive operation based on the risk uh, on the physical and based on the risk in the cyber. Can we now do something across the domains, have a cyber physical system that is risk aware? We can definitely do that. So this is an active research right now. So we have the cyber layer that has the adaptive operation in the software defined network uh, as a 5G network, for example. And then we have the physical layer that we enriched by more physical technologies such as energy storage systems and uh, more uh, innovative controllers that are distributed or uh, more adaptive. And we are able to come up with a cyber physical system that will understand the risk on the physical, will understand the risk on the cyber, and will feed, provide feedback uh, across those layers to improve that adaptive operation overall. All right, so that's an example for an existing cyber physical system that we're able to play with some resilience elements to improve its performance on both layers. How about something that does not really exist now, but we can think about it for the future? This is where we started looking at one example for autonomous systems. In energy system, an example of autonomous systems are microgrids. And microgrids are really small, um, uh, self-maintained uh, with enough resources to provide demand and supply within, uh, within the resources uh, in that small geographical area. So I think about it uh, maybe like as a university, a university can have its own microgrid defined within that parameter. Now, can we actually uh, envision for the future within uh, an autonomous framework that those microgrids can be more elastic, more fluid, more flexible, and they can actually re-cluster in, uh, in groups and then interact within groups. And we have some mobility of energy, uh, uh, leveraging connective, connected mobility, that will enable provide resources so that this, uh, this dynamic operation can happen. We found that this could happen and some other works uh, by colleagues actually leverage this for self-healing networks on the distribution on the cyber physical energy system. So this can happen. So this is where resilience by design is included. Why? Because if any part of and, uh, the figure on in the middle to the right, if that distribution power link has been targeted by uh, maybe a storm or a tornado, the, the system will continue to operate because it can cluster now into different cluster, uh, into different pieces, groups, given those constraints. Let's ask, us, ask ourselves uh, another question. So if we look at cyber physical system, are those approaches enough? Do we need to understand more about the physical system itself or the interactions between the cyber and the physical system to be able to uncover vulnerabilities or zero day threats 
uh, that we uh, we are not aware of. And that is actually um, a finding that we were, uh, we had mixed feelings about. <laughs> so we were able to uncover an attack um, that unfortunately cannot be detected or mitigated right now, except by uh, really expensive technology. Uh, the attack that we were able to uncover in uh, large transmission systems is if between areas on the transmission system, there exist some low frequency oscillations in the power signal. Those uh, low, uh, low frequency oscillations, if we switch a load on and off, are resonating with the same frequency, then we can trip off generators and that could cause cascading effects. So this attack is happening at uh, 0.7 Hertz and really small loads. Nothing uh, can really be done about it because it will look like a real load switching. More research is needed to understand the structural inherent vulnerabilities in our cyber physical systems. Okay, now we said that we have uh, increased interdependence between because of connectivity, because of innovation between the different uh, critical infrastructures. Would I still be able to do uh, those really um, intricate cyber physical studies? Or can I use a more holistic approach that is data led using uh, different learning, uh, data learning and data analytics, but keeping in mind that all of these systems are different, keeping in mind that we need uh, some uh, context for the events and some context for the control and actuation. So this is an active project that we're working on right now uh, to uncover uh, the possibility of cascading effects between critical infrastructure systems and uh, with the, with uh, um, with an approach that's similar to uh, uh, like biomimicry. So you always have the brain that understands the whole situation, but you also have neurons in your limbs that will inter that will respond uh, quick, like in a more in more efficient way to local threats. So this is uh, the work that we're going through right now, and it's, it is needed. Um, for next generation network and uh, 5G, this takes another perspective. So remember the case where we talked about um, first responder networks. Can we leverage 5G, although it's a, another complex system, but can we leverage it? Because it will expand the point of connectivity from the first responder, uh, first responder um, agents uh, the actual uh, victims or impacted people uh, to the services, can we leverage the flexibility in that system and the virtualization to move that SDN, remember the SDN function that we talked about, improve that SDN in an automated fashion. So can we automate security functions for not only first responder, but uh, first responder, intelligent transportation system, energy system, uh, with an understanding of the physics for that system. And finally, I will close with uh, some of the two really important problems that I think more research should go into. One is um, generalizing all of this to the uh, all in a framework that applies to all cyber physical system that continues to be risk-based. The other element is uh, we always have an operator that operator might not be as many right now. But we are seeing models where automation is increased, but human is still part of that loop. Uh, we, do not, we do not want to uh, join uh, the voices that say human is the weakest link. We want to uh, empower that human in the loop to be the, the really a strong link in the operation of the cyber physical system. So can we model that, those interactions and provide a decision-making framework enriched and contextualized to enable the human when the uncertainty levels are beyond the system capability to address in an automated fashion to be leveraged to the human with something that aligns with the cognitive abilities to enable the human to make those timely decisions. All right, that concludes. Uh, thank you for listening. Dr. Hamad, uh, my name is Joan Santos, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. It was all very interesting, um, and today we'll be facilitating our Q&A. Um, to begin with that, um, with so okay, with uh, such complex and interconnected systems and system of systems, right? How do you even begin to collect data, real data, to uh, to realistically model 
those systems? Uh, excellent question. So uh, traditionally, we have relied on uh, models, so like uh, theoretical models. So theoretical models are not duplicated. They are still needed. Uh, we now use another uh, complementary data collection, which is uh, the digital twin. So we have a lot of IoT devices. We can employ a lot of IoT devices. Those IoT devices will collect more environmental and internal uh, uh, picture of the system, the complex system that will augment our models. So our models have limited capabilities, but this digital twin will enable us to better understand those complex systems, especially on a larger scale. Um, con uh, this collection of data is possible because of uh, innovation in communication and in sensory. Okay. Um, have you partnered with uh, industry or, uh, the, or the government to obtain reinformation from the physical infrastructure already deployed in the cities? Uh, so I did work with uh, with with industry in Canada during my PhD uh, research. Within that research, we used uh, practical models from this industry, so we can work on that. Uh, collecting information from actual deployed systems is enabled by TISPITS. So I work with IEEE, uh, closely with IEEE, and IEEE has access to those TISPITS. Some of the TISPITS uh, in the UK are actually open uh, in the, like available and deployed in the cities. So with the right part partnerships, you can obtain some of this information uh, if the purpose is for research. Many, many thanks. Um, next one. Um, so as the vision of 6G starts to be discussed, um, do you think, uh, do you see any big changes related to securing cyber physical systems as compared to with what is coming with 5G? Uh, excellent question. So yes. So we we see a lot. Um, so some of the work that I haven't mentioned here is about data. So a lot will be a lot of that will be related to data. How is data shared? Who owns data? And all of that stuff. So we anticipate with six G that we will have uh, better frameworks with sharing the data and sharing the insights with with stuff with robust models about sharing the insights. Uh, cybersecurity of interconnected or all like a smart city, let's say a smart city, cyber physical security for smart city will probably be uh, an easier challenge than what we see with 5G. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, next one. Um, how is resilience quantified in your models? And uh, what, are, what are the mathematical tools that you're using to, to analyze it? Uh, yes, excellent. So, uh, so far for resilience, I did borrow from reliability, system reliability models. So uh, we, we define it as the time to stability in some, most of our work. So if you can maintain stability within a certain region, that's our measure of resilience. How, how resilience is the system is how, how long we can maintain stability. That's in some of the work. In other work, we defined resilience as the degree of the flexibility of the system. And there are some, some works that uh, borrow this. Uh, use the same principles and it's based on graph theory. So I borrow from uh, reliability uh, reliability theory in power systems and from graph theory in other uh, on cyber on the cyber. Uh, other theoretical tools that I have used in overall I've used game theory, I've used uh, graph theory, I've used uh, control theory and I've used uh, uh, dynamic system dynamics. Many thanks. Um, so that, that, that this one is from Bruce Crawford. Um, uh, I have been told that hackers like to enter complex targets uh, via fire and safety systems due to the intrinsic latency issues with current that uh, which currently do not allow these types of systems to migrate to the cloud, uh, which allow for a more secure environment. Uh, will 5G and adaptive system software-defined networks solve some of those issues? Um, this is a really good question. So um, OT in general, uh, including fire safety, including uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear engineering, uh, many of those systems will continue to have um, inertia against moving critical operations to the cloud because of the dependence. Uh, 5G 
we are seeing trends and instances where this is changing, like the resistance is not as strong because they can see evidence of the advantages of having operations in the cloud, especially with the increase in ransomware attacks, right? So uh, the increase in ransomware attacks and the COVID, the whole COVID, uh, like prompted companies to rethink their existing infrastructure and their inability to access it remotely. So a cloud could really move their operation and optimize their operation and give them more flexibility. So this reluctance, um, what, we, what we previously said, technologies that cannot be moved to the cloud, we are seeing a shift. It's not as fast as we would like, but it's changing. So I think with 5G, if 5G security and automation provides enough trust for those utilities, for those water uh, organization, for um, nuclear energy operators, if, they, if we are able to provide that level of trust, then more operations will move to the cloud. And that will improve the security because we have more control in the cloud over, uh, we have more visibility and more control. So you would say that it is not technically a lim uh, technolo technological limitation, but rather the trust and how the public sees the use of the technology. Oh, that's one. The other one is cost. So the reason why uh, why many of the operators continue with their uh, older technology is that technology was built to last for 20, 25 years. And that's one of the main challenges in OT security. Now, if you touch a device that's 25 years, uh, you cannot deploy security technologies on that device. Uh, there's, very, it's, there's very very limited that you can do. You can only do some holistic approach around them. So the cost is a barrier, but uh, similar to what I've just argued at the very beginning, uh, people are seeing uh, an advantage of doing putting that cost in front because a disruption in operation will cost you much more as we have seen in the pipeline attack, right? I see, no, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple of questions from uh, Yaseki Buda. Um, how do you quantify vulnerability, vulnerability risks? So there are two approaches. So in, in the mainstream cyber, cyber field, we quantify risk for vulnerabilities using the typical framework where risk is equal uh, likelihood times impact, right? If I may, if I may, um, and how, how do you, how you then define impact, right? Is it in the sense of disruptions or uh, how do you even start this so, analysis? So, so, so let's uh, go back. So we have two main, two main approaches. The, the first approach is the mainstream cybersecurity approach which quantifies risk based on impact and vulnerability. Impact, uh, vulnerability is quantified by um, like many metrics. So you can take into like um, the, the CVE severity uh, like how severe is that CVE? Like what are existing controls that you have in place that will reduce the risk? Uh, what is the threat intelligence telling you? Is this something that's happening to your industry or not? All of these elements contribute to the likelihood. On the impact, you take it as a process and the business impact. If this was interrupted, what is the impact on that process? And usually this is very defined in, within risk uh, management frameworks. So it translates to uh, loss expectancy. So if you have the, if this happened once, what is the cost to your business? So that's the impact. So this is the mainstream cybersecurity approach. What I'm proposing in this work, what is, and what is, uh, many people are working on is to quantify risk in a way that uh, takes into account the actual operational impact. For example, if there is a denial, distributed denial of service, what is the actual impact on my system? It is either loss of data, absent data, or delayed data. If I take that as the actual impact, I can quantify the risk in a way that if I can quantify it as a delay or absence, like the absence is infinite delay. If I can quantify it as a delay, then I can include that in my operation as a closed loop parameter. So my, my system is aware that there's an impact. What's, what's beautiful about this approach is then we are able to not only consider cyber attacks, but we are able to consider uh, malfunctions in the system, contingencies in the system. We are able to come up with a framework that can handle both. Wow. Wow, super, super cool. That, that's, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah. And very powerful. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, also, um, what, are, what reliability metrics would you recommend for 5G and beyond networks? 
Uh, um, there's a lot. Uh, so um, everything is built out in five for 5G is everything is built out in 3GPP. So if you're looking at a certain uh, a certain cyber physical system, they have they are coming up with standards that define uh, the service quali the quality of service for all of the quality of service metrics or SLAs for that uh, type of application. It, it drills down to latency, uh, mm -hmm. capacity on the channel, like what is the rate of information? And it, it's different because if you're talking about uh, control systems, they do not, they do not need uh, that, that throughput, but they need reliability. Reliability is the availability of the channel with, uh, with, with guarantees on data loss, minimum, minimum bound on, uh, maximum bound on data loss. So these are all spilled out in the 3GBB standard right now for 5G. Okay, thank, thank you, thanks so much. Um, we have one more from uh, uh, Marcus Vasconcelos. Um, decentralized systems can also communicate implicitly through physical interconnections by acting strategically uh, as in game theory, uh, by passing the explicit, explicit communication over the network. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered this possibility in, in your work? Yes, 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 yes. So in, in our work, we, 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 we do not, we do not deny that centralized operation is the best point of operation for any system. What we're saying is uh, with increased distributed, uh, so, so uh, in resilience, there's something called uh, uh, resources, distributed resources or like uh, capacity resources that enhance capacity. If I have enough resources that enhance capacity and there is something that's going on in one area of the system and I have enough awareness about that area we recognize that there is an opportunity to be able to switch from centralized to decentralized. If the question is about uh, enabling communication on physical links, such as uh, power line communication, uh, the uh, disadvantage of those systems is once the, there's a disruption in the power system, it will take a, as well the communication. So we disrupt both the physical and the cyber at the same time. So it's not it's not helpful from a resilience perspective. Okay, um, I think we still have time for one more question, and I'm gonna use this time to I'm gonna steal this time to ask one of my own. Um, so in your um, so in your contributions, right in cyber risk uh, adaptive operation, you I think you considered uh, decentralized centralized systems, but um, have you also considered hierarchical multi-layered system systems like in uh, in power grids where I have high voltage and lower voltage sub distribution uh, subsystems? Perfect, excellent. So uh, you you will see in both problems for the uh, for the microgrids and for the transmission system, we consider the hierarchical because the the distributed can actually break out into centralized within a region and distributed within small regions. So we did consider the hierarchical. You can still maintain that operation, like in a it's. Uh, a, so let me tell you this, like a, a certain one generator could be part of a really local operation, very distributed, or, or could be part of a hierarchical operation where it's part of a, an area within a larger control scheme. So we did consider the hierarchical. In the microgrid network, you can be a microgrid operating by itself. So that has its own cyber physical dynamics and control, or you can be part of a coalition, a bigger coalition, which is three or five microgrids. So that's hierarchical, right? Because then you will mm -hmm. plug your coordination into the bigger coalition coordination. Okay. And in this analysis, do you have to assess and evaluate the entire system in one go, or could you evaluate a fraction of or a local uh, section of one of those subsystems? So it's different for different uh, propositions. So in one proposition, uh, you it will you will have maintain autonomy of the system. So the system will will provide the system with autonomy to manage its local and will only interact for certain requirements. And that is favorable for autonomous system operation. Uh, and, and in other problems, uh, the analysis will be fully distributed, meaning we assume that all agents in that fully distributed uh, system have complete picture about the system to be able to react. But they okay. will not do the, all the analysis. They will do the analysis that is related to their section of the system. Okay. 
Oh, thank, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Hamad, uh, thank you so much once again for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting, uh, inspiring, I have to say. Um, thank you so much to you again and to all the, the, the attendees um, for being here today in the fall seminar session. Um, so now if you let me uh, announce, uh, so if you let me share uh, my screen. Perfect. Um, now I'm glad to announce the next presentation in our series today, The Road to Equity Conscious Research in Cybersecurity by Dr. Gloria Letson Billings. And uh, that's going to start in five minutes. So um, stay tuned for our next session. It is a pleasure to be here with you all.